Get five coffins ready. Hey, what's up everybody? Shimoki here, and today we're going to be talking about the subclasses of mages in Smite. So what are mages? Just to recap, well, they're guys that do damage with their abilities, and they tend to do the most damage in the game. That is to say the highest damage potential, not necessarily that they get the highest player damage. But if you're a new WoW player, I would hope you get top damage. This is how I'm going to break down subclasses, what their strengths are, why you pick them, and what you miss out by picking them. And let's be clear, subclasses aren't real, in quotes. This is just a generic tagline to help break down and make it easier to understand what specific gods do, because obviously even though they're called a mage, they all do different things. So this way we can sort of split them up into their own groups and say, hey, this one's generally like this one and this one's kind of like this one. So I hope that makes sense and let's get into it with burst mages. Now, obviously, their first strength, they can kill enemies in one combo, no problem. And they do the most amount of damage possible in the game in any short given amount of time. And why you pick them? Well, you want to shut down hyper carries by killing them. I mean, Afraya can't run at your backline if you just one shot them. So there you go. And of course, Burst Mages are also great to make up for magic damage elsewhere. So say you have four physical gods on your team, you don't want a sort of utilitarian character on your team. You want a character who's going to put out insane amounts of magic damage. And this obviously makes more sense when you think about on the enemy team, if you see four physical, you want to stack physical protections. But if you're stacking physical protections, you now have a Scylla doing 1200 damage to you. And it's also just fun to kind of become the hyper carry yourself. You're not just one-shotting hyper carries, you're one yourself. And of course, as the game gets later and later, the stronger and stronger they become. Although very early on, you'll notice that they're very reliant on cooldown, since they kind of do everything that they want to do in one single combo. So everything's on cooldown after they finish their combo. And they can't really build too much CDR and still one-shot. I mean, once you hit super, super late game, sure, you can have a lot of CDR in your build and still kill someone in one and fell swoop, but generally speaking, if you focus on too much CDR to try and get those cooldowns lowered, you're going to lose your one-shot potential. They also tend to lack range, not to say burst mages don't have range, obviously they're ranged, but they don't have the longest range in the class, which you know, only makes sense, but still, it's a downside. And they also tend to be a little bit less mobile, and if they are mobile, it's usually a sort of mobility where it's still easy to chase them afterwards. And of course, they have to kind of have harder to hit abilities in general. I mean, if you're allowed to one-shot someone, it's gotta kind of be hard to hit. Not a huge deal, but still, there are easier mages out there. And they are also pretty bad from behind. You can't burst someone if you don't have your items. That's something I touched on last time. So with that, let's move on to artillery mages, who are kind of the opposite of burst mages, but are kind of the exact same thing. So what their strengths are, they obviously have the longest range in the game. Nobody can match their range, let alone their damage, which is still extremely high and sometimes warding on the most damage possible in one single ability. But artillery mages don't really focus on doing three or even four ability combo to one shot somebody like a burst mage might. And they actually generally still have low cooldowns despite a high impact and a high range. You pick them when you want to avoid being jumped on by assassins or tanks, which trust me will still happen, but you can keep yourself at a longer range. And instead of trying to burst down a hyper carry to kill them, you can instead just poke them out with your high range damage. Afraya can't get to your backline if you're poking her out every 3 seconds. And of course also they're really good at chasing down mobile characters with their long range abilities. Like say someone jumps on you when you're Thoth, you dash away successfully, and then you root them. Your teammates hit another form of CC, any CC really, then you just ult them. And it doesn't matter if they used a dash or a leap, that ult is going to catch them. But what you miss out on is generally limited mobility. And of course it's the same sort of idea here, if they have mobility it's usually easy to chase, like a thought dash. And just in general their survivability and self peel is nowhere near as good as even a burst mage. They really don't have a lot of self setup, that is to say hard CC, and therefore they can't really self peel either. So they're really reliant on their teammates, despite a huge range, to help keep them alive. They also don't have fast combos. They require a lot of setup, setup from teammates as I just mentioned as well. And it takes a decent amount of time to get all their damage down range, nothing like a burst mage. And it has to be said, they tend to have pretty hard to hit abilities, because they're at such a long range. Dealing burst damage this high at a huge range, yeah, it's gonna be only natural that it's harder to hit. But let's move on to the easiest mages, poke mages. Now, they're strong in consistent damage with low cooldowns. It's no biggie if you miss an ability, like if you were a burst mage or artillery mage. And of course, this means, focusing on CDR, that you always have the abilities to retaliate against divers with. Say you get jumped on, you're going to hit them immediately with 1-2 to two abilities that are near burst mage levels of damage, and you're going to have them back up in 5 seconds. And of course, constant damage application means they're good against tanks too. Not great, no ability based mage is really great against tanks, but Soul Reaver is a big help here. And they also have better CC than previous subclasses as well. Probably the best so far. 
maybe not in terms of self setup, but in terms of self peel, self setup, and peeling for your teammates, yeah, I would say they have the best so far. And of course, you pick them when you need a little bit more tank damage, or just in general, you want to ward off hyper carries, like as I've been mentioning, Freya. Now that you have a little bit more CC, but a bit less damage, you can just keep spamming and spamming and spamming so they can't get in. Same idea with tanks. For example, a Kumbakarna. Kumbakarna needs to blink into a team fight, but he can't do it if you keep on poking him. But what you miss out on is that they probably have the lowest mobility so far. I'll have to double check, but I'm pretty sure they're the least mobile thus far. And they also tend to have the least range. Not no range, again, it's pretty decent. But you do have to keep yourself at around medium range to keep on spamming those abilities out. And they really can't one-shot anyone until very, very late game. That's one of the benefits of mages, is that they just keep on getting better and better. They kind of won't feel super impactful in that sort of late game situation that's not quite to late game, by that I mean buying something like a 3k pot. And with all this, they tend to suffer with mana issues, which, again, I've complained about it. It's not really an issue in Smite, but there you go. Other mages, they don't really tend to have mana issues, but poke mages definitely have mana issues. Now we move on to the most loosey-goosey class, that'd be Utility Mages. Now their strengths are that they still have really explosive damage, even if it doesn't come out that fast, but they definitely have the best CC in the class by a country mile. I mean, this is self-setup city, as well as setting up for your junglers, too. I mean, whenever I got a Jean-Cui in my game, who's not ADC, when I'm a jungler, I just feel overjoyed. All he needs to do is press 1 on the enemy's head, and I can kill them no problem. Same with an E set as well, and this means that they tend to be pretty good from behind. Not great, but as I mentioned with Guardians last time, a 2 second silence like from E set is still a 2 second silence no matter what way you cut it. So even though if she gets behind she's not going to be putting out that damage, she's going to be putting out that CC. Of course you pick them for setting up for themselves as well as your teammates. So of course if you have a jungler that you want to get ahead, well just gank the utility mage over and over again and they'll set up for you basically. And with all the CC, they can be difficult to dive in a teamfight situation. It can be really hard to get through all of like an Eset, a Hades, or a Jean Kui CC, and a Guardian CC at the same time, plus all the damage too. And here, instead of damaging carries and mages, how about we just lock them down instead? I've said Freya about 15 times in this video, but I'll mention her again. What's Freya gonna do if you just silence her as soon as she twos? That is to say, to break up her 2-1 combo. And of course you're picking them too if you need more widespread CC on a team. If for instance a warrior and the assassin aren't really bringing the CC you want, you can just do a utility mage instead in mid. Because obviously with the way the game's balanced, if those guys are lacking CC, they probably make up for it with damage, which you'll be setting them up for. But what you miss out on, they're definitely the least mobile subclass. I mean, as I mentioned, it can be hard to get through all of like an E set and a guardian in CC, but if that E set doesn't have her guardian with her, um, yeah, she's gone. So in that sense, you just kind of need to counterpick these utility mages with whatever assassin can dive them safely, and then, yeah, they're gone. And also, they can poke or burst, but it's not nearly as effective or at as long a range, as you would see with a burst mage or, god forbid, an artillery mage. I mean, these guys are basically the opposite. Although this subclass really is fantastic to feel like you're always capable of doing something, even if you get behind. So we'll move on to everyone's favorite, healer mages. So what their strengths are, they can heal, and they do a lot of damage. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. My name's not even Ted. But they also heal themselves, so you do damage and you heal yourself. I mean, sounds like a simple concept, but that can be nice. And why you pick them, it's just because you want a healer. And generally speaking, you want to try and pick around whatever healer gets chosen, especially if it's like a hell or something, someone who's very much on a knife's edge. You want to be able to protect the healer. The healer doesn't really have a way to protect themselves, generally speaking. Yeah, Hell has a Cleanse, Chunga has her 2, Afro has her ultimate. I mean, these are quote-unquote ways to protect yourself, but um, yeah, when you have uh, two or more people running at you, it doesn't matter. You're not going to heal your way, and you're not going to damage your way out of it either. So you need teammates who are going to play around you and have the characters to play around to defend you. And on that note, you pick them when the coast is clear. No Odins, no Serkets, no Osiris, no Susano, nothing, nothing that can so easily shut down a healer. So that's why it's kind of dangerous to pick him in a blind pick. I mean, if you're partied with five people, yeah, you can pick a healer in a blind pick situation, no problem. But in ranked, if you pick a healer too early, you're going to get countered 17 ways to Sunday. It's not going to feel good. And obviously, what you miss out on is ability damage and CC. Yes, Chunga, earlier this year, she could one-shot, no problem. But now that she's been toned down, she can't really one-shot, and neither can Hell or God forbid Aphrodite. They don't have the most range, nor do they have the most raw damage. So you're really lacking in those two departments, obviously made up for with the healing. And they tend to be pretty immobile as well, with no CC to speak of, really. Again, there's Chunga Ultimate, Afro Kiss, Hell's Slow. 
Uh, it kind of pales in comparison when you look at like a Hades, Jean-Quay, or Eset. So if you haven't gotten the vibe yet, yeah, they are definitely the riskiest subclass to pick, but they can be easily the most impactful in the game by country mile if your team plays around you. So you're kind of going to get slapped around if you solo queue as these characters. Not to say don't try it, though. Um, <clears throat> anyways, back to my best friend Freya, we're going to talk about ADC mages. Now, of course, their strengths are they are unreal late game. No matter what the meta is, if you reach late game with a mage ADC, it's a joke. They, they do so much damage. And of course, just like with burst mages earlier, you're bringing a new damage type to the draft. What do you do if you're against a really strong hunter? Well, you build things like Spectral, things like Bend Guardian, and so on. But when it comes to magical protection, there actually aren't really that many good anti-attack speed items. And of course, they don't crit, but they hit like they crit. So Spectral is pointless against them. Not to mention, of course, it has physical protections anyways. So they sound kind of OP, but they're definitely not. So you pick them when they're very good in the meta. So what does that mean? That just means whatever items they have that they can build are very, very strong when compared to, say, what a hunter could build. Or vice versa, maybe just the hunter builds aren't doing what we need them to do, and then the mage ADCs come in to save the day. Which, of course, is definitely the lamest reason so far, but it's definitely been proven true after 10 years of smite. I mean, these gods are either very good or they're very bad. So it's a little lame, and if you're new, it's hard to wrap your head around. But yeah, they are really dependent on balance. Of course, what you miss out on, of course, as I just mentioned, they're very balance dependent, so you can pick up and learn a mage ADC, but they might not even be good balance-wise, and it's not even your fault that you get slapped around. And they are also all very immobile. There's not a single mobile mage ADC, and that's kind of by design. Literally for what I just mentioned, because despite having no mobility as an ADC, uh, they can still run the game no problem, so if they had a lot of mobility, it would be super unbalanced. And of course, if you use basic attacks instead of abilities for full damage, which, you know, can come in negatively depending on how your team drafts. I mean, if you blind pick, say, Elder Run mid, but then your teammates are picking, like, Erlong Shen, an attack speed hunter, Bakasur in the jungle, I mean, yeah, it can feel pretty bad because they're just going to stack anti-attack speed against you guys, and then you're not even going to have a lot of mage damage. So make sure you have a proper mage and a mage ADC. But speaking of proper mages, let's talk about mages that are not proper assassin mages so what the strengths are is that they have a better damage ceiling than physical assassins generally speaking that is to say they don't really cap off the way assassins damage kind of caps off towards the late game just like their other mage counterparts these guys can one shot and keep one shotting and keep one shotting and one shot a little harder maybe in the super late game so their peaks are a lot peakier and of course they also bring a damage type early on that supports and solos just can't really build for they're playing against warriors, they're playing against hunters, and of course they're just unique to play. I mean, you can see how many there are, so yeah, they're pretty special characters to play as. So why you pick them? Unfortunately, it's another kind of lame one. It's because they're really strong in the meta, because there's a build that's very, very strong for them, or just like assassin builds just aren't cutting it, so you go to a mage assassin instead for more proper damage in the late game to be killing these carries. And what you miss out on is obviously what mages are known for, ranged burst and ranged damage on a moderate cooldown. So yeah, they don't do that at all, and Al Kuang doesn't even play in the mid lane, the general role for mages. He plays in the jungle. He's that much of a not mage, despite doing magical damage. And just, in general, they tend to not have very good early games. And um, that's kind of it for mage assassins. But that brings us to the end of the subclasses. I hope you enjoyed the video. What's your favorite subclass to play on? Did this open your eyes to the strengths of other characters you maybe thought weren't very good? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching.